I noticed the other day y'all had a big, big campaign with them police officers for shutting down them people, barbecue, wedding, dance. Man, how y'all expect these people to make money and survive? Oh, Miss Cheryl, that is far from the truth. The EPA and the Guyana Police Force are actually working together to ensure that persons who conduct certain businesses and activities are authorized. We've tried to allow them to adhere to the noise regulation. Well, this can be a new law. What lies this? These laws were always in place. It's now that we're getting all these complaints at the agency, we are trying to enforce them. The Environmental Protection Act has been in place since 1996, and it says that persons and businesses must apply for environmental authorization before operating a song making device. Well, girl, I never know this thing is prior to the law. So if you're keeping a barbecue or an open air function, like a wedding or a concert, especially in your communities, Right? And you're playing a music system, you have to apply for a short-term noise permit. And for persons that operate in a business and you've got generators and stuff, you have to apply for a long-term permit. And that is applicable to bars and hotspots and clubs also. Well, now that you explain it, I understand it. It's unfair to the elderly, sick people, and even them little children. That is correct. According to the World Health Organization, loud noise can cause stress, sleep deprivation and hearing impairment and I sure you wouldn't want that. Oh, now I understand. Thank you for explaining it, Miss Julie. For more information, you can contact the EPA at 225-5471 or visit our office at Ganji Street, North Sophia, Georgetown. Welcome to the Environment Matters, a monthly production of the Environmental Protection Agency in Guyana, where we explore the work of the agency in the areas of environmental management and biodiversity conservation. By now, you are accustomed to seeing officers of the agency talk about the various aspects of our work. This month's episode, however, will feature representatives from partner agencies in with, with which the EPA works. In the first half of our show, we'll have a representative from the Caribbean Youth Environment Network talking about international coastal cleanup in Guyana. And in the second half of our show, we'll feature Mr. Walter Narain, who is the director of the Solid Waste Department at the Mayor and City Council of Georgetown. So as mentioned, with me today is a representative of the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, Ms. Sufain Dash Allen, who is the Public Relations Officer of the organization. And today we're going to have a discussion about ICC as we fondly know it. Give us the history. I know that there are several chapters across the Caribbean. You can tell us about some of the, the countries that um, have a CYEN chapter, what is your, your organization's purpose? And of course, as a PRO, um, you, you would want to share some other information. So, Safane, I will hand over the discussion to you. Hi, thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Safane Dash, and I am the PRO of the Caribbean Youth Environment Network chapter in Guyana. So, the Caribbean Youth Environment Network as in the name, is a youth-led organization, a non-governmental organization that is, spread, that is spread throughout the Caribbean. We were founded in 1993 and in Guyana we've been, we've been um, on and off for about since 2001. So we have very vibrant chapters with very vibrant young people doing a lot throughout the Caribbean. Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts, Belize, almost Aruba, even associated CARICOM states are involved in, um, in CYN. We, we focus on letting youths have a voice against certain environmental activities or environmental activism activities such as climate justice, climate action, um, fight against pollution, fight for, um, for youths to have a say in climate justice, fight for... Um, we're actually working right now on having many countries recognize climate change as a 
as a direct thread that involves youth and having you and letting youth be a part of the discussions that involve um, passing laws to actually fight against climate change because as we know many of the Caribbean nations are SIDS and they have they are very vulnerable to the effects of climate change so we in Caribbean Youth Environment Network want to build the capacity of youth to represent on these scales and that is our main focus right now to ensure that we build the capacity of the youth in the Caribbean so they can have a very vibrant and vocal role to play in environmental protection. The Caribbean Youth Environment Network is the national coordinator for um, the International Coastal Cleanup in Guyana. But a bit of history in the International Coastal Cleanup. The International Coastal Cleanup was started through the Trash Free Seas Initiative, which was fighting for um, trash free seas, um, oceans without pollution. So the movement was taken for by Ocean Conservancy and they decided to harness the power of the people to fight this initiative, to have this initiative going for ocean, oceans to be pollution free. So the purpose of Ocean Conservancy, um, they started with the aim and, and the intention to protect and preserve marine life from pollution. However, over the last 30 years, the activity has become larger and more involved with many countries um, joining the International Coastal Cleanup, one of them being Guyana. So through the engagement of citizen scientists around the world and local partners such as the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, um, the aim of the um, International Coastal Cleanup has been broadened. So they have now moved to um, removing and recording uh, data when it comes to the trash we pick up because we want to analyze the trends in the in the trash. We want to identify what are the sources, what um what trash are we seeing more than often, what are the the impact this would have on the marine life because as we know the different types of plastic can impact different types of species of animals differently, straws and so on. Also the one of the main aims of ICC through Ocean Conservancy is changing the human behavior and showing true awareness and participation because when they participate and they see the impact that this that the pollution is having on our coastline and the marine life it can spark um, great change so when it comes to ICC in Guyana and CYN the International Coastal Cleanup body in Guyana was a, is partnering with Ocean Conservancy for the execution of the International Coastal Cleanup Day. Um, for, for years now that has been occurring but the Caribbean Youth Environment Network in Guyana has been in the national coordinator since 2014 and has been a part of the official data collection process for ICC and has grown and expanded the activity. Moreover, through the assistance of partners like the Environmental Protection Agency of Guyana, we are able to ensure that data recorded from the cleanup informs the government, informs government policy and decision making um, in case in point with the styrofoam ban because as we, as we collect the garbage, we mark the type, the amount, and over time we analyze what we are seeing more than often and what can be a major issue. So as we are seeing that styrofoam was a major issue on the coast and that led to um, Guyana actually banning styrofoam. So in 2019 we conducted two cleanups. One on the coast of Georgetown by Kingston and one at the famous 63 Beach in Burbies. We collected a total of 6,849 pieces of plastic with plastic bottles being the number one collected piece of, piece of plastic along with bottle caps, plastic pieces, styrofoam pieces and so on. And we found some really unusual items also. We found cell phone cases, suitcases, shoes, toothbrushes, things that don't belong in water. It's like, why would someone throw a whole suitcase <laughs> in, in the ocean? So it, sh it shows to say that, um, it comes to say that we keep, along with EPA, has, have compiled a report and it is available on the EPA's um, website. And you can see a breakdown of all the top 10 
pieces of plastic we collect types the plastic bottles being a number one as i am as i mentioned even when i was there cleaning up i had like four jumbo size garbage bags full of dust plastic bottles it was really an eye-opener for you to see what um what people are doing when they go to these beaches and so on because you're supposed to only leave your footprints not the not the garbage you bring so I read with like Guyanese to so take a look at the report and see that it is no longer um, unknown that uh, what we do to the oceans is no longer unknown um, the impact our population can have though we are small the amount of garbage we produce is great and the data is there and it can and it was gathered and collected by, the, by Guyanese themselves so there's no biasness also when it comes to the plans we have in pipeline, well, we all know right now we're dealing with a global pandemic. Um, ICC always, last year, we attracted over 800 volunteers in total. And so we can't have that um, this year. So in the incoming days, we are um, working on ways to, to still push the agenda of ICC, which is marine, fight against marine pollution and preserving marine life. So we're working on harnessing the power of social media. So we will be um, posting on our Instagram and our Facebook page, um, which is Caribbean Youth Environment Network in Guyana. And we will engage participants and we will talk about issues such as marine debris with our partners, such as EPA. We'd like to just not let it be a one year, one off thing. We'd like to further look into and, and see the trends if and by by the end of the year or by December if there's no longer the issue of bottles if it becomes bags if it becomes boxes or so and also eventually we'd like to actually take the cleanups to Riverside because we recognize that the issue goes beyond the beach goes beyond the coastline but we still need to look at the other um, waterways and how they are being impacted by our um, or um, pollution. So, Sufain, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And I wanted to pick up on one point that you made before we go to our first ad break, and that is that ICC is not just an activity where we go out on the seawalls one morning. Um, we network, of course, because they're representatives from various organizations, um, whether they're political youth groups, they're religious youth groups, community-based organizations, schools even. Um, we often have individuals who have an interest in the environment who just come out to lend, you know, some time and some effort towards our activity. Um, but the, the point is, ICC is more than just picking up other people's trash because oftentimes during those events even when I was a Leo before I started to work at EPA I was a part of ICC and you would always hear an older person saying well you know why are you guys picking up other people's trash you're just wasting your time because that doesn't make any sense but I want to remind those of you who are watching and listening that when it comes to protection of the environment, we always say every action counts. And what we do is more than just pick up the trash. We record what is found, we analyze that data, and of course we're working to make um, the collection of that data more scientifically sound because there are instances, as you would have mentioned earlier, um, where our decision makers use that data to inform policy as was with the case of the styrofoam ban and of course because we've been doing this event for a number of years we're able to see trends as it relates to the, the trash that we collect and with that we'll take our first ad break and we'll see you on the second half of our show where Mr. Walter Narine from the MNCC will be joining us. Um, we talked about ICC, which is uh, a national-led event, and we want to hear a little bit about how solid waste is managed in the city limits. And of course, we're talking about our capital city of Georgetown. So stay tuned. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. 
We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. Are you involved in a business or thinking about starting one? Do you know there may be environmental impacts from business activities? According to the Environmental Protection Act of 1996, businesses such as gas stations, rice mills, large-scale agriculture and poultry farms, large-scale mining and forestry operations, hotels and resorts must be authorized. Persons proposing any of these activities need to submit an application for environmental authorization to the EPA. Welcome back to the Environment Matters. In the first half of our show, we had a representative from the Caribbean Youth Environment Network, Ms. Sufain Dash Allen, the PRO of that organization, uh, talking to us about CYN and about one of their signature activities, the International Coastal Cleanup, which usually takes place in the third Saturday in September. For this half of our show, we have a very good friend of mine, Mr. Walter Narine. He is the director of the Solid Waste Department of the Mayor and City Council of Georgetown. All right, thank you very much, Sherita, for having me on this program. I'm very happy to be here to discuss solid waste management in the city of Georgetown. As you're aware that I'm the solid waste management director for Georgetown Municipality. I've been employed for the city in excess of seven years. Right, and I've seen a gradually um, increase in terms of um, people understanding their roles and mitigating the amount of waste we have disposed on the streets and in the thoroughfares. Right, when I started way back in 2013, we would have had in excess of what about 28 illegal dump sites in the city. Right, um, with the help of the government of the day and stakeholders we were able to manage those and bring it down to a minimum of about two or three that you have popping up. So my role basically is, um, as you say, to manage the waste that we generate in Georgetown. And we generate a lot of waste in Georgetown, to be honest. Georgetown generates in excess about uh, 210 tons of garbage per day. And this is um, very high in terms of per capita as compared to the Caribbean countries and in, in internationally too. Right? And you could probably put that down towards um, a behavior change um, over the years that where a lot of families used to be cooking at home, right? And taking food to work and packing their kids' lunch bags to a generation that we have now that everybody eats from the fast food outlets, everybody buy water and it's surprising to see a lot of people buy water at schools, buy water at work and you have these facilities at home that you could walk with, right? Um, but that's what I'm saying, the amount of waste that we generate is very high and we need to find ways and means to combat this and to reduce this waste, right? Um, sadly, is a, if you look at the waste composition in Georgetown alone, Right, um, you will have 50% of that waste is organic waste, and every single day that organic waste is being taken to landfill and be buried. Now, you all know that organic waste could produce compost, which is organic fertilizer, and you can grow your cash crops, you can grow your vegetables, you can grow anything with those things, and it's far healthier, right, as compared to the chemicals that we have that's fertilizing our crops. 
And if you take it the walk at any of the municipal markets, any of the markets, or any of the supermarkets, you will see these big, huge um, vegetables in the market. And when you put them in your pots, you will see how quickly they wither up and turn to water. Right? They're not healthy for us, but we continue to do it. And it's something that will take a massive effort, not just for the municipality alone, it will take a massive effort from a, a country as a whole. Right? This is not um, a municipality role alone. It is your role, it is my role, it's everybody's role. And what we at the municipality are trying to, always trying to advocate is we would like to encourage partners to come on board with us. We might not know everything, we might, might not see everything, but a fresh pair of eyes, a fresh idea can come towards combating. Because this is a country problem. Right? And not only Georgetown, any part of the country will have littering at the roadsides and at the markets when they're finished, they'll just leave all the stuff there. So my role basically is so managing this amount of waste on a daily basis. And Georgetown, as you know, is um, from Commons Lodge on the East Coast to Agricola on the East Bank. And that's about 15 square kilometers. Right? Um, way back in 1970, Georgetown was just five square kilometers. Right? Um, the then administration would have extended the boundaries of Georgetown. And that's where from Vicentian Road, they take it from Vicentian Road to Commons Lodge. And from Independence Boulevard, they take it from there to Agricola. Good. So that is where the amount of people we have to manage in terms of waste. And it's very strenuous, honestly, because of the volume of waste produced. So the municipality of Georgetown, because of um, wear and tear of vehicles over the years, have sought to hire private contractors, right? And what they have done, way before I came on to work in municipality, they would have divided Georgia into 10 groups. And five each, five of these groups each are given to the private contractors. And you would think that, okay, fine, that is the end of it, and we'll have a clean city. That still is not sufficient because you have the business sector, and they produce a lot of waste too, right? The business environment, and that we're talking about Central Georgetown, that's Regent Street, Water Street, Main Street, those areas, right? We have uh, all the influx of people that traverse the city and the business hub. They produce about our uh, 28 to 30 tons of garbage per day, right? And we have moved from, and if you look for the last three years, and I would have assessed this, we have moved from going into a store, buying our commodity, taking the packaging materials at home, to a lot of the, the foreigners who are visiting our country short term, they're going into these stores, buying the commodities, taking off all the wrappings, and leaving it in the stores, and they take the commodities at home. Right? And they're taking it to their native countries to sell. Now, all of that waste finds its way on the roads, in the bins, and we have to take care of that daily. Right? Um, so it's very challenging. It is very challenging. And that is why I'm saying partnership is a very is a key, is a key role. So we have to take care of Georgetown. Not not only not, not saying our advocates to neglect other areas, but when visitors visit our country and we welcome them, they stop here, the hotels are here. Central Georgetown, and that way they take an image back from them. It's a cleaning Ghana or a dirty Ghana. But so it takes a lot of work for us to change the agenda, the behavior pattern, right, of our people, and it takes a unified effort. Some of the projects we would have looked at, and I mentioned the 50% of waste is organic waste, we would have seen that and, start, and start pilot projects in terms of composting. Now, composting is basically a, a process in terms of natural degradation of the waste incorporated with carbon and phosphorus, which is like, you can get that from uh, manure, you can get that from wood chips. And over a period of uh, six weeks, you can have compost material, which is organic fertilizers, which is rich in nutrients and is beneficial to the plants. Good. So we would have started pilots in our facilities and we would have taken that to our primary schools. We had 20, 28 primary schools in Georgetown and we'll take the message of composting, of waste separation, right? Because sad, to this day, we're not separating our waste, 
right? And any time, if any of, uh, many of you would have traveled overseas, and the time you trudge down there and you settle in wherever you're going to stay, you are told you have to separate ways. This container for this can, this container for this paper, this container for plastics. We cannot do that right now because separating waste is one part, but having the facility set up to collect those separate waste, to recycle it, is a different thing, right? The municipality of Georgia cannot do this by, its own, by themselves, right? Um, so advocate for separation of waste, let the citizens of Georgia separate the waste and we collect those waste to try to do something with it. We can't do that. So we, we depend heavily on our business partners or, or in small entrepreneurs who come in, we can share the data and have those facilities set up, right? With the blessings of government, of course. So composting, we have taken that message to the primary schools in Georgetown, and we have teach them, and I'm very happy to report that majority of the schools have started the compost, right? And they're excited. We have to change our behavior, and it's a behavioral change, and I see not Georgetown, I don't want to see Georgetown return to its garden city. I want Georgetown to be better than its garden city, right? Because I don't want to go back to something. I want to be better than it was. And it takes a unified effort from everybody, from the smallest child to the biggest adult, to come together and fix it, right? And I welcome, as the director of always man, I welcome all the cleanups, all the, the cleanups. What my concern is, is sustainability. Right, so in as much as you want to do clean up, we welcome you, but let us plan sustainability. That if you can clean up this area, we can provide bags, we can provide resources for you, and then every month, then you can always come back and we can clean it up together. Right, look at Car Car Melville that did a fantastic job on the seawall. That was one man, just one day he got up and said, listen, I want to clean up this place. And look at the movement he starts now. Right? I mean, we had an uh, uh, NGO before that was doing the same thing, but we need to continue it. So that's my part from today. Um, I would like to encourage you to take your own garbage bag. You have, I mean, every household, and I can guarantee this, every household has a reservoir of black bags inside. Right? Everybody got a drawer, they got black bags inside, they have a canister of black bags inside then why do you need to go to the supermarket with your hands, empty hands? Take your own bags, man. Right? Don't bring home additional garbage. Good? Take your own water and your own water bottle to work, to go anywhere. Right? Take your own container. If you're going to go and buy food from one of these fast food giants, take your own container. Don't bring home the packaging materials. Good? Because, again, supply and demand. If there is not a demand for the packaging material, the entrepreneur will reduce the amount and we all will be a better environment because we have to factor the environment. We have to. This is Mother Earth. This gives us life and we have to protect it now and the future. So, Mr. Narayan, thank you very much for coming on our show and sharing with us. And please remember that the advice that Mr. Narayan gave is not only for the, the residents of Georgetown and those who pass through, but it's for all of us. Each of our individual actions count when it comes to protecting the environment. And with that, we come to the end of our show. Um, thank you for joining us. Remember to stay in touch with the EPA. Like us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can pick up a copy of the Sunday Chronicle or the Ghana Times and read our weekly column. Um, listen out for us on Radio FM and Radio Mabruma at 95.1 FM, 104.3 FM in Linden, 104.1 Light FM and Let's Gaff at 102.5 FM on NCN. Remember that the ban on single-use plastics is set for 2021. So join us in the fight to end plastic pollution. Make that switch today. And of course, don't forget to download a copy of our 2020 magazine. That's the Green Note. It's on our website, www.epagayana.org. Um, thank you once again for tuning in.
I noticed the other day y'all had a big, big campaign with them police officers for shutting down them people, barbecue, wedding, dance. Man, how y'all expect these people to make money and survive? Oh, Miss Cheryl, that is far from the truth. The EPA and the Guyana Police Force are actually working together to ensure that persons who conduct certain businesses and activities are authorized. We've tried to allow them to adhere to the noise regulation. Well, this gonna be a new law. What lies this? These laws were always in place. It's now that we're getting all these complaints at the agency, we are trying to enforce them. The Environmental Protection Act has been in place since 1996, and it states that persons and businesses must apply for environmental authorization before operating a song-making device. Well, girl, I never know this thing is prior to the law. So if you're keeping a barbecue or an open-air function, like a wedding or a concert, especially in your community, Right, and you're playing a music system, you have to apply for a short-term noise permit. And for persons that operate in a business and you got generators and stuff, you have to apply for a long-term permit. And that is applicable to bars and hotspots and clubs also. Well, now that you explain it, I understand it. It's unfair to the elderly, sick people, and even them little children. That is correct. According to the World Health Organization, loud noise can cause stress, sleep deprivation and hearing impairment and I sure you wouldn't want that. Oh, now I understand. Thank you for explaining it, Miss Tony. For more information, you can contact the EPA at 225-5471 or visit our office at Ganji Street, North Sophia, Georgetown. At the Environmental Protection Agency, we believe that the environment is everybody's business. We can start caring for our planet by becoming more environmentally friendly in our everyday actions. Here's what you can do. Dispose of waste in a garbage bin. Clean our drains, yards, and carpets regularly. Take a reusable shopping bag to the market. Support local butchers and farmers to reduce packaged waste. Plant a kitchen garden, trees, and flowers. Compost your organic waste. Conserve water and electricity. Carry a reusable water bottle. These little acts are good for your health and that of the environment. Remember, healthy people work better and achieve more, and together, small actions make a big difference. For further information on how you can help, please contact the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Ganji Street, Sophia, or telephone us at 225-5467. You can also visit our website, epagana.org, or our Facebook and Instagram pages. door by me breaking on this big big building and it's bare asbestos in the roof. I could remember hearing on your TV program that asbestos is dangerous to human health and the environment. This is correct. The Environmental Protection Act states that any person or facility that is storing, treating, transporting and or disposing of hazardous waste material must be authorized by the EPA to do so. Oh! But it's now we're really hearing about this hazardous waste thing. Tell me something more. Hazardous waste are waste material with properties that are dangerous or capable of having a harmful effect on human health and the environment, including things like paints, fertilizers, and pesticides, waste oil, and asbestos. These things have the potential to cause cancer, birth defects, kidney failure, and reproductive impairment with children being at the highest risk. The environmental authorization in this case gives the legal right to transport, store, and dispose of this material in accordance with the EP Act Chapter 2005, Laws of Guyana. 
And this ensures you and your operation and your process is safe for the environment and human health. So you mean to tell me that all them leftover Christmas spain that I got on in my kitchen sink, I need authorization from EPA to get rid of it? No, Miss Deborah. These items once used for household purposes does not require environmental authorization from the EPA. However, you should still take necessary steps to ensure that these materials are stored and disposed of in an environmentally safe manner. Thank you so much for the information. I go in and tell him that he needs an environmental authorization. Thank you.